Uh, let's get started with our today's talk room. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, my great neighbor, Professor Chris Ellis from Chemistry Department of KU. Uh, Chris graduated from Colorado State University and then got his PhD from University of Wisconsin in Medicine. He then did a postdoc at uh, USC and then Oregon National Lab. Uh, he joined KU as assistant professor in 2009. Uh, he then went on over, uh, uh, as a career award. I hope I said over for us. I wish. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, uh, National Science Foundation career award in 2012. Uh, they work on physical chemistry, ultrafast laser spectroscopy, which is a great experimental tool, as I know, and the study chemical reaction dynamics. So today we will talk about probing the reactions of molecules with five second laser pulses. Please join me to welcome Professor Alice. Well, thank you. That's the first time I've been introduced as a Nobel Prize winner, so <laughs> hopefully not the last, but I won't hold my breath. So. <laughs> um, well, I, I want to thank everybody that I've met with today. I mean, I, I know a lot of faces in the audience. Most of you have at least seen in passing at some point. Uh, but it's been really fun to actually stop and, and take some time and sit down, have it on the schedule to sit and meet with people. Um, I've been running pretty far behind schedule all day. And that's a really good thing, right, when it's about good science. And so I appreciate that. It started first, first off this morning, so thanks. Um, <laughs> we just kept it going all day. Um, so anyway, it, it, thanks for having me here um, to tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing in, in my lab um, here in Malat. Um, the other thing I, I thought I'd point out is that I'm, I'm coming from chemistry, and so I think you know usually at these things I, I don't think you guys are, are shy to ask questions along the way, um, but please please do that. I'm, I'm doing my best. I was a little intimidated by the idea of a physics colloquium and trying to hit you know every audience as best I could. So um, some of you will probably think there's too much molecular spectroscopy, and others will think I didn't talk enough about ultrafast spectroscopy. Um, but hopefully there's somewhere in the middle. But but let me know. Um, I think that's that's a problem. You know, as, as chemists, we're often been told um, you know that we're the central science and so we let it go to our heads a little bit and so you know if you see that coming through forgive me um, a bunch of my students are here though and um, I'll remind them that of course chemistry is all founded on physics right <laughs> I think you'll appreciate that um, and and I constantly remind my students the same way my PhD advisor reminded me that we're not real chemists because we don't really make anything. So um, hopefully this fits right in with with the physics colloquium. So <laughs> uh, anyway, there will be some chemistry somewhere along the way, um, but but let me um, tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. So. Um, I'll start with some motivation and and what it is. Uh, you know what's the. So the, the driving theme behind the work that we do. Um, so we use ultrafast spectroscopy to study the reactions of molecules and really try to understand at a fundamental level what it is that controls chemical reactions. Um, and, and why do you want to do that? That's because we'd like to make molecules do useful things for us, right? Um, if I were a real chemist, I might make something. Um, as, as a physical chemist, you know, I like to study something, understand how it works, and hopefully towards the goal of letting a real chemist make something that does something better. I guess. Um, so the Nobel Prize um, a couple, two years ago now, um, was awarded to, to these three gentlemen for uh, molecular machines, motors, and switches. Um, and so the picture here comes from Ben Faringa's lab, um, which is uh, a picture of a molecular motor that he made, um, which undergoes, it's a, it's a four cycle process that's driven partly by light and partly by thermal reaction. Um, starting with uh, a, a light, it's, a, it's based on isomerization around this this carbon-carbon double bond in the middle of the molecule. So there's a, a light-induced isomerization that takes the molecule uh, one step along the way, and then a thermal reaction to isomerize some more, a second light-induced reaction that continues the process, and then a thermal reaction that brings the thing full circle. And what's really neat about this system is the way they designed it, it works only in one direction. And so it's a unidirectional motor, and so that you could actually think about doing something useful with this um, based, based on this isomerization. And so this is what it means to, to understand chemistry and, and be able to make molecules molecules do reactions um, that we would like them to have um, to do something useful. Okay, um, And if you're not a fan of just molecular um, motors, um, you know, there are some examples out there of uh, cars even. Okay, So nanoscale machines are really here now. Um, this is a picture from the, the, the first ever nano car race that was run um, in 2007. Uh, 
2017. Um, and so there were each of these, these molecules raced on a surface. Um, and, and again, these are, these are molecular machines. Each one is an individual molecule. And it's about harnessing a chemical reaction to do something. And in this case, it's moving these, these, these cars along the surface. Okay, um, and so you need to, to have some control and some understanding of the chemistry to make this happen. Um, the winner, there are a couple different ways you could win this race. Um, my favorite, though, I think, is, is the green one up here, which won um, with a record of uh, one micron in 26 hours. <laughs> so, so I guess you know, there's, there's some work to do, and, and hopefully uh, you know, that's where we can fill in the gaps as we learn more about um, what controls chemical reactions and, and how we can make these things uh, do what we really want them to do. Um, so you know, as, when, we, when we come into this and we think about controlling reactions, what are the different ways that you can control a reaction, the outcome of a reaction in particular? Um, and, and not just control it. What do I mean by control it? But this is to selectively make a molecule do what you want it to do. Um, and, you know, chemists have, have always used heat, right? We all use heat. Cooking is, is chemistry. It's thermal reaction. Um, but it's not very specific, right? We can put heat into a system. We can make molecules overcome a reaction barrier and make something Thing happen, but it's it's uh, you know the trained organic chemists can do a lot better job than I can, um, but it's not very specific about what you're doing. And if you want to control things on the, the the molecular scale, like a nanocar, heat can be a difficult way to do that. Okay. Um, we can think about mechanical energy, and some of those cars move by, by atomic force tips that are moving cars around on surfaces. Um, other people have started thinking about how you can selectively make and break bonds through mechanical chemistry. Um, this is maybe a ways out. We have optical tweezers, but you know, how selectively can you actually break a specific bond in a molecule? Probably a reasonably selectively, um, but how efficient is it if you're trying to grab individual uh, molecules and probably not that efficient. Um, so of course that leaves us with with light or optical excitation, um, which I think is is um, you know a pretty powerful way to control chemical reactions. We have control over the photon that gets absorbed, um, and depending on wavelength and and various other properties of the system, then presumably we can control the outcome of a reaction. Um, I hope to show you that we can do this selectively and efficiently. Okay, it's, you know every reaction is a little different, um, but that's that's kind of the goal that we're after: how to how to do this, control reactions um, efficiently and, and selectively. So, so here's a, a, a snapshot of some of the work that, um, that we've done in, in my group. This is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of some of the projects we have going and what our, our ideas are for using uh, light to control reactions um, and, and to, to, to put molecules to good use. Okay? Um, so we've done some work with, with two-photon activated chemistry, um, things like uh, uh, light activated fluorescence probes um, that are excited with two photons so that you can do selective spatial um, imaging um, in, in biological systems, for example, or to do something like photodynamic therapy or drug delivery. Um, so there's a project we've worked with Rich Givens in chemistry on doing two photon release of ATP so you can initiate some biological process. Um, we've done some other work um, on uh, using plasmon mediated photochemistry. This was a little bit of a, a, a change for us, but thinking about harnessing nanoplasmon plasmonics and how can we use uh, nanoplasmonic fields to induce chemical reactions using low intensity irradiation in for systems that otherwise wouldn't go. Um, so this was related to, to two photon excitation. Um, We've done more recently, we've, we've looked at dynamics of, of molecules in confined environments. This actually starts to look a little bit like that mechanical chemistry, mechanochemistry, um, but we're, we're still light activated, but where we have restrictions that can control reactions. And of course, this is, this is what proteins are really good at doing when molecules get crowded into a protein environment to have specific reactions. That's real control at the molecular scale, and it's, it's made possible by the protein um, around that chromophore that does, does the reaction. Um, but the part that I'm going to tell you today has been kind of an ongoing story um, since I came to KU, um, looking at optical control of, of photochromic molecules and how we can use light pulses and, and as I'll show you, um, pulse sequences to really control the outcome of a reaction. And I'm going to tell you that it's not, for me, it's not really just about the control of the reaction. It's what we learn along the way. This is fundamental 
um, chemical reaction dynamics, what is it that controls the reaction, um, what we learn from, from these studies can control any other reaction or can be applied in a lot of different situations. Um, and so hopefully that's, that's what I'll, I'll teach you today. Um, I th I'm going to try and do this in, in, in three different parts. Um, and so I thought I'd start off and, and just kind of describe how it is that we uh, can observe dynamics and what does it mean to observe the dynamics in, in, in a, a molecular reaction. Um, how do we do that with, with spectroscopy and, and, and this, this idea of a potential energy surface. Um, and, then, and then I'll tell you something about how we've used this pulse sequence to, to change the outcome of, of a reaction of that photochromic molecule. Um, and then the exciting part is, is kind of where we're, we're really uh, most invested right now and still kind of ongoing work in thinking about um, what is it that we learn? Okay, so ultimately, can we learn new physics when we start probing these molecules in ways that we haven't probed the molecules before? Okay. So uh, here, here's my attempt at, at um, kind of giving an overview of what it means to study chemical reaction dynamics. Um, you know, for me, it's it's about a, a potential energy surfaces that describe the motions of the atoms in a molecule. Okay, so this is um, really it's a, it's a semi-classical way to represent um, uh, the the dynamics of, of a molecular system. Um, that's based on the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, right? So we take the separation of electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom. Um, the idea being that the electrons move rapidly and, and relatively independent of the slow nuclei. When we do that, then um, we can uh, describe the motions of the nuclei within the potential that's, that's determined by the electronic structure of the molecule. Okay, so the electrons provide the potential that describes or controls the motion of the nuclei. Okay, um, and so what this means, I can only show two-dimensional pictures of, of these potential energy curves. So pick your coordinates here. These are some vibrations of the molecule. But of course, what we're doing is showing the potential energy of the nuclei in all of the, the degrees of freedom in which the molecule can vibrate. Okay, so think of an isolated molecule, 3n minus 6 vibrations, where n is the number of atoms in the molecule. Um, and if you think of some hypersurface in this number of dimensions, that's what this potential energy surface is. And that's what controls everything about a chemical reaction. That's what controls the motions of the nuclei for the most part, right? Um, so, um, you know, we think about reactions, what is it? Well, we have a ground state potential here, um, and I'm, I'm talking about adiabatic potentials, okay? Um, so this is, this ground electronic state describes the motion of the molecule um, when the electrons are in their lowest configuration. Um, and this describes thermal reactions, right? So it describes, first of all, the vibrations of a molecule. The molecule sits in the bottom of this well and vibrates, okay? You can do that quantum mechanically or you can do it classically, however you want to do it. Um, your harmonic oscillator gives way to anharmonicity, and in this case, there's a barrier that the system can go over with enough energy, with enough thermal energy, you can climb the barrier and get into the other isomer or vice versa, okay? So thermal reaction paths are all defined by that ground electronic state, potential energy surface. What my group is most interested in are the dynamics of molecules in electronically excited states. And so take adiabatic potential energy curves of, of the system when the electrons are in um, not in the ground electronic configuration um, and this in the same way shapes the motions of the nuclei um, once we excite the molecule up to there. Okay, so this is, this is photochemistry. Now, there are a couple of, of, of particularly interesting points about this, right? And so when we do photochemistry, we use the energy of a photon to excite an electron. That puts us on this upper surface. And now we can think the semi-classical view. We can think about a marble that's rolling downhill, right? Basically, what it's doing is it's, it's converting that, that initial photon energy into nuclear motion. Okay, somehow the system has to get back down to the ground electronic state, um, and the way this happens is is usually through something called a conical intersection, which is a point in this hyperdimensional space where the two surfaces are allowed to cross. Okay, um, and so um, it's really it's this it's a conical intersection because it crosses, uh, it avoids the crossing in, in two dimensions um, and crosses in all other degrees of freedom. Um, and, but this is what allows the system to move from one electronic state to another as, the, as this um, trajectory or this marble rolls its way through that funnel back onto the ground state. Okay. Now it's interesting because this, this crossing point is where the separation of nuclear and electronic degrees of freedom breaks down. Okay, so the Born-Oppenheimer approximation doesn't apply at this point. Um, so what does that mean and how does that influence the outcome of a reaction? And this is starting to get at the fundamental questions that we're interested in studying. Um, 
you know, as, as how does the motion of the system through this region affect what's, what's happening. Um, and, and I guess the bottom line is that this is what allows us to change, change between these electronic states. Um, and so ultimately what we're doing then is taking that photon energy that went into electronic energy and now turning that electronic energy back into nuclear energy. Okay, so the vibrations of the molecule, it's thermal energy. Um, and all the systems that I'm going to tell you about today are in solution. So pretty rapidly we collide with the solvent, dissipate that energy into the surroundings, and we end up back in the bottom in one well or the other um, that determines whether we've had a reaction or not. Okay. So there are a lot of interesting questions about trajectories through these conical intersections and around these conical intersections, things that are related to geometric phase, um, what happens if you take a, tr a path around the conical intersection uh, as, as opposed to avoiding that conical intersection on one surface. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that, that we'd really like to, to start to explore. Um, and of course, what happens in that conical intersection is not something we can observe directly because the system moves through that region just too fast in, in a few femtoseconds or less. And so it's not like we can actually catch catch the molecule in this interesting point where the Born-Oppenheimer approximation breaks down, we kind of get the before and after picture and we have to piece together the story. And that's, that's what I do. Um, that's, that's the idea behind um, this, this photochemistry that, that I'll tell you about. Okay. Um, I probably don't have to say much about the technique, but we do use ultrafast spectroscopy. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple forms of that. Um, ultrafast <laughs> I guess ultra-fast means different things to different people probably, right? 26 hours to go a micron is not ultra-fast in my book, but if you race nanocars, maybe it is in yours. Um, attoseconds is pretty fast. Attoseconds is the time scale of electron motion. There are people who do this. This is really the realm of physics. Um, we do not do this. We, are, we look at things on femtosecond to picosecond time scale because as chemists, that's the time scale for the nuclear motions. Bonds are being broken and formed and rearranged. And so um, that's, that's the range that we're, we're interested in. Okay. Um, so we do this with transient absorption spectroscopy, um, right? taking snapshots uh, of m basically molecular movies, people like to say. They're not really movies, right? We don't actually take photographs. We have to do this through spectroscopy. Um, and that's unfortunate because photographs are easy to look at and see what happens. My group will tell you it's not always easy to look at a spectrum um, and know what it means, and so there's a little more interpretation involved. Okay, uh, But just as an example, um, you know, sort of a, a, this... Uh, thiophene derivative uh, molecule. And don't worry about the molecules in here. Um, you know, they, they do some things, but the size of the molecules are relevant. Just the simple physics of it that's interesting. Um, this particular system, we excite it. In the excited state, there's some uh, structural rearrangement. It basically planar, it goes from a non-planar structure to a planar structure based on that change in the electronics. Um, and then undergoes an, an inner system crossing. It goes from a singlet state into a triplet state on a few picosecond time scale. And so we can map out that time scale with this transient absorption spectroscopy where we're measuring the electronic absorption of the molecule and how it changes as a function of time. Okay. Um, the other technique that I'm going to tell you about today is, is, is very closely related to that. It's uh, a transient vibrational spectroscopy instead of transient electronic spectroscopy um, where we use uh, stimulated Raman scattering um, with femtosecond time resolution to measure the evolution of the vibrational spectrum of a molecule. Okay? And so we excite with, with one laser pulse, uh, with a femtosecond laser pulse, and then there's a, a, a pulse sequence to do the stimulated Raman process where we scatter through the resonance with a higher line electronic state, bring the molecule back down into a vibrationally excited state. And if we do this spectroscopically, then we can measure the vibrations of the molecule and we see how those vibrations change as the molecule moves along this S1, which is the, the lowest excited electronic state. Okay. So this is what it looks like when we do this, this transient Raman technique. Again, we, we, we measure uh, a vibrational with vibrational resolution. So this is a few milli-electron volt resolution in here. Um, and we can measure as a function of time over hundreds of femtoseconds to picoseconds and, and see the, the structure of the molecule evolve. Okay, and, and so there's some, some tricks here in, in getting the, the frequency resolution um, and, and on a time scale where you, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see it with, with the temporal resolution we have. 
Okay. Um, together, though, you know, this is a pretty powerful way to probe the, st the structural evolution of a molecule. We have electronic spectroscopy, vibrational spectroscopy. The vibrations tell us something very directly about the structure of the molecule, right? Because we can assign vibrational bands to specific motions of the atoms. And so then as we look as a function of time, as things evolve, do those frequencies shift? That's telling us how the, how the structure of the molecule changes in that electronic excited state. And so, for example, we can take the ratio of these, these two vibrational peaks here and show as a function of time, um, this, uh, the, the ratio changes as the molecule planarizes, and so we can measure a time scale very directly for the planarization of the molecule. And we know exactly what's happening in terms of the structure because of the vibrational specificity of that measurement. Okay. So there's some complications with this. Um, in, in particular, the way that we do this Raman, the way we make this Raman technique work, is to be in electronic resonance with a higher lying electronic state. That means that we have, first we excite the molecule when it's in its excited state, then we use a, a Raman transition that sits in resonance with this excited state absorption band. Okay? Um, and what that means is that the intensities, the frequencies that we measure, are the frequencies of the molecule in that first electronic excited state. But the intensities that we get for those different vibrational bands depend on the character, of the identity of the upper electronic state. Okay, so that's going to be important when I tell you later. Um, I'll tell you some more later. Um, but you can see that if we calculate what we, we would call an off resonance spectrum that ignores that resonance condition, we get very different intensities than the experimental. Raman spectrum that we measure, okay? And this is because we get this resonance enhancement in specific modes. And so in this case, this is the mode that we calculate has a very strong resonance enhancement, and it has to do again with the character of the molecule in the upper electronic state, okay? Um, so, um, just, just uh, to explore this just a little bit more, so we can, we can see that this is a resonance. So I'm calling this a resonance enhancement from being resonant with that electronic transition. I can show that by tuning my, my Raman excitation wavelength so that I go from sort of an early resonance directly onto resonance with this excited state absorption band. And what we see is that overall the intensity of these vibrations increase. That's why we like this resonance Raman because it gives us much better signal to noise, much stronger signals. Um, which means then we can also be species selective because I can tune on to a specific chemical species in solution and see that species over anything else in that solution. Um, but again, it also turns out that it's vib vibrationally mode specific. And so it's not like the entire Raman spectrum becomes stronger. Some modes become stronger than others. Okay, and that's what tells us about clues about what's happening in the upper state. Okay. So remember, this whole business is about understanding these potential energy surfaces. What are the shapes and what are the, 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 the slopes, for example? How would a wave packet move on any one of these potential energy surfaces? And this resonance Raman technique, resonance Raman itself is, is nothing new. This goes back a long time. Um, but resonance Raman has long been known to, to give you information about the, the, the shape of the potential of the upper electronic state. Okay, and so you can, you can describe this Raman scattering process using a time-dependent uh, theory um, that describes, uh, the, it's basic, describes this as the, the motion of a wave packet in the excited state, how the time-integrated overlap of that wave packet, how integrated over time, that wave packet overlaps with the final um, vibrational wave function back in the ground state. The more overlap you have integrated over time, the stronger the Raman transition. And so this can be related then to the motion of that wave packet that you've excited from the, the ground state vibrational wave function. Okay? And this is different, this, is, this can be different for every different vibration of the molecule. So the, the vibrations where there's a displacement in the upper surface will get a stronger resonance enhancement than the other vibrations. Okay? Um, now, I'm not going to go into much detail about this, but we've explored this um, with uh, uh, Professor uh, Marco Caracato in, in my department um, and, and two graduate students, Tim Quincy, who, who earned his PhD from me in August, uh, and Matt Barclay, who's a, a joint student um, doing both theory and experiment on this project. Um, but we've, we've shown that we can, we can extract information from that experimental spectrum in terms of the, 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 the gradients of the upper state potential energy surface. Okay? So it turns out you can take what's called the gradient approximation, and if we care about the motion of the wave packet on that upper surface, really all we need to know to a first order approximation is how steep is that potential, so that when we excite to the upper surface, how quickly does that wave packet move out. 
The, st the, sh the steeper the gradient, the faster the wave packet moves, and it turns out that gives you the best overlap in that particular vibration. Okay? Um, and what that means then is that we can relate the intensity of any individual Raman transition to the square of the slope of the potential energy surface along that particular vibration. Okay, so I'm not explaining all my terminology here, but this is just the slope of that potential <coughs> along a vibration. Okay. Again, I'm not going to go into much detail, but I just want to show you that we, we do know how to calculate these things and, and to show you that it, it does work. Um, so we can calculate what these, potent, what these electronic states of this molecule look like. So if we start in a ground state, we have a transition. What we have to do is allow the molecule to relax in that electronic state so we find the optimized geometry of that electronic state and then calculate all of the upper electronic states. Okay, and these are calculated states for the molecule that I was just showing you. And I ignore it everywhere else, but there are a tremendous number of electronic states in this molecule. Okay, and so this is something that we sweep under the rug. Only some of these have strong transition strengths. Only some of them are also uh, um, are, are, are have, have allowed transitions, um, and so a lot of these don't show up in the spectroscopy, um, but we um, still can, but are, are still there. Okay. So the calculation, um, just to show you a little portion of the vibrational spectrum that I was showing you before, this is the experimental spectrum with the resonance enhancement in this, this strong mode down here at 700 wave numbers, down um, low frequency mode. Um, and what we have to do is calculate the gradient for each of these electronic states that we could possibly go to. Now for simplicity, I'm only showing a few of the states that have some transition strength, um, but you can see from that when we calculate the gradients, we get one particular state um, which has strong oscillation oscillator strength that has a strong tra electronic transition, but also has, uh, we, we recover the, the, the shape of, of the vibrational spectrum based on those, that gradient approximation in the calculation. So what this means is that we, with, this is with a fairly le high level of, of theory that we can calculate what those upper state potential energy surfaces look like. Okay? All right. Oh, and so then we can assign that we know what the, the vibrations are to make sense. Sir? The, Sorry. Is, yeah. the electronic, is that electronic structure or is that electronic plus vibration? These are all electronic states. So we don't do anything. So all we take is the electronic state and then we take small displacement, small with respect to the vibrational displacements, and calculate the gradient. And that gradient, which is just a first order approximation of the, transi the Raman transition strength, is what reproduces the experimental Raman spectrum. Okay. Like I said, I was going to get into a lot of molecular spectroscopy. Too many for some of you, I know. Um, I did promise some chemistry, so let me get back to the chemistry a little bit, okay? Um, so again, it's, it's all about understanding these potential energy surfaces and how that controls the, the reaction, okay? So let's, let's get to the chemistry. Um, let me go to a different system. Um, this is the, the photochromic molecule that I promised in, in the abstract, if anybody read that. Um, so this, this is a system that we've been, we've been studying um, pretty extensively in my group. Um, it's, it's photochromic because it changes color under irradiation with light. Okay? So in one form of the molecule, it's the, the reaction is all about the central six carbon atoms. In one form, there's a closed ring structure that has a conjugated backbone that allows pi conjugation across the entire backbone of the molecule. Um, this gives a, big, a strong absorption band in the visible, and it shows up as, as a nice deep purple color in solution. Uh, if we shine visible light on this, Eventually, um, you know, through photochemical reaction, we can open that six carbon ring that breaks the conjugation in the molecule. It doesn't show it up here, but that means the molecule sort of comes out of plane into two halves. That's why we break the conjugation. Um, and that leads to something that is only absorbing in the UV, and so it's transparent in solution. Okay, if we shine UV light on that, we can very efficiently close the ring. You can go back and forth, and as an advisor, you like this because you buy it once and you use it over and over again. Um, but it turns out we, we also like it because, um, you know, never mind the big organic molecule up here, it's all about the six carbon atoms. The rest of the molecule are, there, is there to, to give it the right spectroscopy so that we can observe it easily in our laser measurements. Okay. So it does have some uses, and, and actually this compound, this, this particular compound is commercially available um, because we're not real chemists, we don't make anything, but we can buy them. Um, but this was designed to be used for data storage. Um, you can think of a lot of other applications, it's been used for a lot of other applications. Um, but the idea about this, of this molecule is that you, you could use this to store information. I didn't say this is, this is thermally stable, so in one form or the other, it will stay there basically forever. 
Okay, so there's a very deep uh, potential in, in one state or the other. Um, it won't convert except through photo excitation. Um, so that would be a great way for, for data storage. You can write ones and zeros depending on the state of the switch. Okay. Um, now it turns out that this, has an, this, this molecule itself has an important property that the, the ring opening yields. So if you start with this closed ring structure and you shine visible light on it, the, the reaction quantum yield is very small. It's only one or two percent of the molecules that absorb a photon will react. And that's good if you want to use this for data storage because you don't want to erase your information every time you try to read out. And so you'd like to sit here and see is it in this purple colored state or not without erasing that information. Okay, so that's a good thing. Um, and it, but it's easy to write because the UV process to close the ring is, is very efficient. Um, basically 100% if it's in the solid state, 50% in solution. Okay. Um, we ask about erasing, though, because eventually you might like to erase and rewrite that information. Here's where this idea of controlling the reaction comes in. Um, there's a process called gated two photon switching that I'm going to tell you about, um, which was uh, shown by, by the Japanese group that described this molecule, that made this molecule in the first place, and showed that under the right conditions, if you use two green photons, you could convert the molecule from the closed ring to the open ring structure very efficiently. Okay, and that's the process that we, that we really set out to understand um, and to, to, to see if we could learn something about control from that. Okay. So the, the, the basic experiment, the transient absorption spectroscopy is pretty straightforward here. Um, we're going to start with uh, everything I'm going to tell you about now in this molecule. We're going to start with the closed ring structure. We're going to excite it with uh, 500 nanometers, which ex uh, in, in principle should, should open that ring. We do transient absorption so we measure the full visible spectrum of the molecule and see how that changes as a function of time. And here's what it looks like. Okay, so I'm measuring that the change in absorption as a function of time. Um, these are different snapshots at different time delays on a picosecond time scale. The dashed line for reference is what the, the ground state absorption uh, spectrum looks like when this molecule starts in the closed ring structure. When we excite it with 500 nanometer photon, then we get uh, a short lived excited state absorption band over here, indicating it's in a different electronic state. And we get a negative signal here because it's a, it's a difference of absorption, and so we've depleted the ground state population. Okay, and so we get a negative signal where there, there used to be ground state absorption, but then we move molecules to the excited state. Okay. Now what you notice as a, as, as a function of time is that this excited state absorption decays on a few picoseconds and the ground state depletion recovers and that says that a lot of these molecules go back to where they came from. Okay. I can show kinetics here. So again on the picosecond time scale watching the decay of the excited state absorption or the recovery of the ground state bleach. Um, we get time scales from this. That's important for telling us how fast this molecule does its thing. Okay. Turns out we extract two different time scales. I'll show you pictures of what this means in a minute. Um, but, a, but a three or four picosecond time scale and then about a nine or ten picosecond time scale for the molecule to get from the excited electronic state back to the ground state. Now, like I said, we recover most of that bleach, um, and that's because most of those molecules relax right back to where they started, um, and so that's why we recover. But if you notice, this, this bleach recovery doesn't go all the way to zero, and it's because a small fraction of those molecules go to the product state where there's no absorption in the visible, and so we have a permanent ground state bleach. Okay, and that's, a, that's this 1 or 2% reaction yield showing up right there. Okay. Okay, so in terms of potential energy curve, cartoon pictures here, this is the process that happens. We can break this down into different parts. Okay, we have the initial photon excitation. We have a fast response, the fast nuclear response. Basically, we've changed the, the pi bonding structure of the molecule. We have some bond alternation changes that happen in 100 femtoseconds or so. Um, we see this three picosecond process is some sort of a barrier crossing. Um, it turns out we can compare this with calculations and know that the barrier crossing here, and it is a thermally activated barrier, um, is due to the carbon-carbon bond stretching. So the bond that we're about to break, there's, a, there's a, an activation barrier to, to stretch that bond. Once we stretch that bond, we still stay in the electronically excited state, and there's another process that's required to get back to the ground state um, that we know from the calculations is a torsional motion. So this is this, this ring stretches open, and then it has to come out of plane, and that's when the bond is actually broken. It's that coming out of plane that allows this system to find that conical intersection. I'm not showing it here, but you find that conical intersection that allows you to get back down to the ground electronic state. Okay, And that process takes about nine picoseconds to find that um, that conical or that, that crossing um, and get to the ground state. And it turns out that the reaction yield, okay, that, that low reaction yield is determined by 
the, I'm not showing the conical intersection, but that the, the topology or the shape of that conical intersection drives most of those molecules back to the reactant state, and only a small fraction of them are able to react. Okay. Um, we can also follow it then relaxing in the ground state as we dissipate heat into the surroundings. Okay, dissipate that, that vibrational energy. Okay, so that's what this molecule does. And um, this is where up to now, you know, the first part of my talk was telling you how do we observe molecules, observe chemical reactions. That's all we're doing. This is why um, we would always say that we're not real chemists because we haven't done anything. We started something, we watched it happen. Okay, um, that's good, but you know, you can shine light on it and you, you can all do that too. So what can we do about it? This is the idea of trying to use photons to control the reaction. Uh, and so um, this idea that I mentioned before of using a, a two-pulse sequence to change the reaction path and therefore change the outcome of the reaction. Okay, so we do a, 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 an experiment that we call pump repump probe. It's pretty self-explanatory. Pump the molecule to one electronic state, pump it again to a second electronic state, and see what happens. And I'm going to show you that this can enhance the reaction by driving more molecules into that product state. Okay, now it is dependent on the time delay between the two photons, and the molecule does have to evolve when we get it to that first electronic state. And that's an important part of this because what it means is that we excite the molecule electronically, the nuclei start to move, and it's not until after they move that we come in and give it its second kick. Okay, if we try to do it right away, we don't see the same effect. Okay, let me show you that um, briefly. Um, this is, uh, if we set two laser pulses at the right time delay, so excite with one laser pulse, come in five, sec five picoseconds later with a second laser pulse, that's enough time to get over this barrier. Okay, we excite it with a second equivalent laser pulse, and then we sit 200 picoseconds later. 200 picoseconds is enough time for the reaction to be complete. We probe what happens. Okay, so now I'm showing you a change in the change of absorption. Okay, so this is the, the, the change in absorption that's induced by the presence of both photons, not just one or the other, but both of them together. Um, and what we see is that we get this ground state bleach signal. Okay, so we increase the ground state ble bleaching by doing this two pulse sequence, okay, at the right, under the right conditions. Okay, and we take this as evidence that we've driven more molecules into this product state than any single photon would have done, right? Because with one photon, the system goes up, it has its one and a half percent yield. Okay, we can't control that, but if we give it a second kick, then we put more molecules into the product state. Now what's interesting is not just that we can, I mean it's interesting we can do that I think, but where we get information about this is we start to think about the time delay between these two laser pulses. So one laser pulse, you know, when does the second laser pulse come in relative to the first one? Now remember I have two equivalent laser pulses so we have symmetry around time zero, okay, but what's the time delay between the two? That's what this is showing as I scan that delay. Remember the, the more negative this signal is, the more of this ground state bleaching I get, and so the more negative signal means I've put more molecules into the product state. Okay, and so as I scan this time delay, it's not surprising that if I wait too long between the laser pulses that I don't have much change. That's just because the molecule doesn't hang around in the excited state for too long. Ten picoseconds later, I'm back in the ground state. Second photon can't do anything. What's more surprising maybe is that there's this delayed onset. Okay, if I come in with 500 nanometers and excite the molecule and I come in with a second laser pulse immediately on top of it, I'm exciting the molecule. There's an absorption there but it doesn't change the reaction yield. In other words, that's, that molecule gets excited, it relaxes back down, and it follows the same path it would have followed if I only absorbed one photon. It's not until um, I let it pass over this barrier on the first excited state, and then re-excite it, that I can change that reaction quantum yield. Okay? So this is telling us something about what's happening in this higher lying electronic state. Okay? Now, I didn't point this out. Um, Here's me just you know, defaulting as a chemist to everybody in the world thinks chemistry. Okay, um, higher lying electronic states are really incredibly difficult to study. Okay, experimentally they don't hang around very long. In every case, higher lying electronic states relax in 100 to 200 femtoseconds for anything with more than three atoms. Let's say. Okay, Cal uh, computationally. I showed you before, there's a tremendous density of states up here. These states are hard to calculate, higher electronic states. We've gotten pretty good at calculating the first excited state of a molecule, maybe the first couple excited states of a molecule, but it gets really, really hard to, to calculate these states higher up, especially for a molecule of this size. Okay? So what we're doing here is an experiment that gives us some sense of what those potential energy curves look like when we go to these upper states. 
Okay? Now this idea of this delayed onset suggests that there's a difference if I re-excite the molecule right away within the first couple hundred femtoseconds than there is if I let it cross the barrier and then re-excite it. And what that means is that I'm accessing different regions of this upper state potential energy surface and that affects the reaction path as the molecule works its way back down. Okay? And so if I do this with the time delay, then there's some pathway that puts me into the product state more efficiently than there was if I did it much sooner. So that's control, right? Now I'm actually controlling the reaction. Okay? And it's reassuring that I told you this barrier, it's reassuring to me at least, hopefully you'll agree, this barrier crossing is this carbon-carbon bond stretching coordinate. So what this says is that if I excite the molecule, but then I try to re-excite it before that, that bond that wants to break, before it stretches, then the extra energy is wasted. But if I let the molecule come over the barrier to where I've broken open that bond, and then give it the extra kick, then it's more efficiently going to find its way into that product state. Okay, so this is, this is where we start to learn something um, at the molecular scale about this. Okay, now I, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but just um, show you that this, this is wavelength dependent, right? So if I excite with, with my green photon in the first case, um, now depending on the wavelength that I use to excite the second time, I can access different electronic states. Okay, and so this green curve here is the one I just showed you where it has this, this few picosecond onset. But if I do this with an 800 nanometer photon, the onset is almost instantaneous. Okay, and so what that says is that this other electronic state that I'm going to in that particular case has a different structure upstairs, and so it leads to a different reaction pathway. So you're, you're measuring these times to a fraction that's right, yeah. So this is about the, the time delay between the laser pulses, right? So one pulse excites, and then we just we delay the arrival time of the second pulse when we measure. So, so actually, what, what I'm delaying here is the delay between the first excitation and the second excitation. The probe, in this case, I sit at a long time delay and just see what happens. So this is what I would call an action measurement. Okay, the negative signal here says that there was an action. The more negative, the more molecules went to product state. Yeah, okay. But the time delay is between the, the pump one and pump two laser pulses. Okay. All right. Okay. So, like I said, I mean, this is starting to tell us something about, I mean, this is a cartoon picture still, right? But this is telling us something about those upper potential energy surfaces that, that really control the reaction of the molecule under this specific two pulse sequence. Okay. All right, and there's some detail here. This is, you know, we actually know more information than I'm showing. There's some fast time dynamics. It turns out it's, it's interesting. This is not just this three picosecond barrier crossing that matters, but also we can distinguish the first one or 200 femtosecond motion as the atoms very first uh, just begin to rearrange themselves. Okay, so there's, there's more information that we can uncover here that, that should be interesting. Okay. All right, so let's see. This is a little bit of a rough transition, but um, this is just to point out that I'm, I'm going to change what we're doing here a little bit. Okay, so we've, we've, I showed you how we observe reactions. I showed you, hopefully, convince you we can control reactions. Okay, but now what I want to do is start thinking about probing this upper state. Okay, I've, I've hinted that we've already probed that upper state, but, but how do we really probe the dynamics in the upper state? That was an action measurement, right? That was your question. I sat way out 200 picoseconds and said something must have happened. Wouldn't it be nice, you know, as an ultra-fast spectroscopist to see something actually happen? Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, I can do pump, repump, and then do my probe right away and try and catch this thing in this upper excited state. Okay, and I can do that. Um, in fact, this is a picture of that. This is the excited state absorption of the molecule after a secondary excitation. Okay, and what you see is that this thing decays about as fast as I can see it. So it takes about one or 200 femtoseconds for the molecule to get to that higher excited state and relax back down to the first excited state. Okay, now I can change the time delay between my green photon and my red photon. It doesn't really matter. Any time I put it on that upper surface, it relaxes back down in 100 or 200 femtoseconds. Okay, and that's not unexpected. In fact, uh, Michael Kasha, the, if you're familiar with Kasha's rule for fluorescence, it's the same idea here, wrote this down in a, in a really beautiful paper, two-page paper in 1950. And he said in his paper, 200 femtoseconds is how long a molecule will stay in a higher electronic state. Everything relaxes to this S1 surface, or this first excited state. That's where it either fluoresces from or does its reaction from. So you only have one or 200 femtoseconds in the upper surface to have any sort of control over the reaction path. Okay? 
And he wrote down just based on density of states and, and electronic coupling um, arguments, um, and that's been true in every system that I've ever seen. There are a few rare exceptions like Azulene, um, but those are kind of special outliers. So that means that, okay, so, so what does that mean? So this, this transient absorption spectrum, this is a transient electronic absorption. I can measure a time scale and just say that the thing relaxes out pretty fast, but this is a broad sort of featureless spectrum, um, lifetime broadened and everything else, and it doesn't give me much spectroscopic information about the identity of that upper state. So I need another way to get a handle on that upper surface, okay? And that's where this Raman technique comes in, it turns out, okay? So if I turn this around, it's, it's a similar to what I just did. I do my pump and then I do my pump two, but in this case now, I'm gonna turn this into a picosecond laser pulse and do a stimulated Raman scattering. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this back into my transient Raman, excited state uh, resonance, simulated resonance Raman measurement, okay? Now remember that this, this resonance Raman that I told you about is sensitive to the displacement of that upper potential energy surface. Okay, I've shown this in one coordinate, but it's sensitive to the displacement along every vibration of the molecule in this S1 surface, okay? So by measuring the intensity, so the frequencies, the vibrational frequencies depend on the potential energy curve here in the middle, but the intensities of the transitions tell me how much displacement there is of the upper surface relative to that intermediate surface. And now I can actually time delay this and measure the, sh the shape of this potential as, of, as I'm moving along the S1 in principle. Okay, you're gonna have to give us a couple years to do all of that, okay? But I can show you, <laughs> that, that's the way it works, right? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with honesty. Um, but what I can do is allow this thing to relax into, say, a minimum on this surface and take a snapshot and try to get an idea of what this upper surface looks like at the point where we do the secondary excitation. So the okay. red arrow is your Raman pump? That's right. So I have a femtosecond laser pulse that excites the molecule. The molecule starts to evolve according to that potential energy surface. At some point later, I come on with a second laser pulse. It's a Raman pump pulse. Turns out it's a picosecond. That's a detail we can talk about later. And at the, uh, overlapped with that picosecond Raman excitation, I have a broadband probe pulse, white light continuum pulse, that does uh, stimulated Raman scattering. And so I pick up, I see the gain at the frequency associated with the vibration of the molecule. Okay, so this is this Raman process. I see a gain and the, the gap there, right? That's the vibrational frequency. So for every vibration in the molecule, I could in principle see a different vibration. And that's what we do, okay? Um, so this is what it looks like experimentally. Um, I, I just wanna point out again, something I said before, and don't worry about the details if I've lost you at this point, um, but there's a difference between the resonance Raman scattering and the non-resonance Raman scattering, right? That's about the intensities that we get. The frequencies should be the same in both cases, but the intensities of the transitions depend on that upper surface and the, the slope of that upper surface. So, so the calculation we do, this is a pretty big molecule, so it's too expensive for us to do the full calculation that I showed you earlier. Okay, so we just do the simple calculation, which is the off-resonance calculation. This is the, the derivative of the polarizability along each of the vibrations, and you square that, and it's Raman spectroscopy. Don't worry about it if you, if you don't know. I can tell you later if you're interested. Um, but we can calculate what the off-resonance Raman spectrum looks like, and we get a bunch of bands that look like this in intensity, okay? Going from high, this should say frequency and wave numbers. Um, so these are, these are different vibrations of the molecule. The experimental measurement, though, is in resonance. And so even if we can't calculate it, we're going through this upper state where the gradients tell us how strong the intensities are in those different bands. Um, if you do this for a living, this is a beautiful spectrum, right, Kristen? If you don't do this for a living, you probably scratch your head, but, but trust us, this is a good looking spectrum for us. Um, but the intensities of these different vibrations that we've assigned here now are related to the, again, it's the square of the slope of the gradient of that one particular electronic state upstairs. All right, this just shows, so, so we're doing, here's this Raman process again, okay? And this just shows I can do the time delay. I can let the molecule move as a function of time delay. So I measure that vibrational spectrum as a function of time on S1. I don't really want you to see that, so forget this eye chart, okay? It's just a colorful picture to show off. Um, but what is important is that we did this at 400 nanometers. So my Raman laser wavelength is 400 nanometers going from S1 to SN. 
Rich Matthews, who's the person, the, the group at, at UC Berkeley who developed this technique, one of the people, but the primary person that developed this, this transient Raman technique um, over the last uh, 15 years or so, um, made a measurement on the same exact compound, but using an 800 nanometer excitation. So these are going to two different electronic states at the upper level. Okay? And these are the same two states I showed you that have a different outcome in that action measurement. So I'll show you that again in a second. Um, they did some time resolve stuff, and again, this is an eye chart. I don't expect you to see all that. The important thing is that we did this at two different wavelengths, theirs and ours. Okay? Um, so here's my calculated Raman spectrum, which ignores any sort of resonance at all. Here's what we get when we're resonance at 400 nanometers. Here's what they get when they're resonant at 800 nanometers. And just as a reminder of what happens, 400 nanometers and 800 nanometers had very different outcomes. Okay? If they had different outcomes, I've suggested through my cartoon that there are different slopes of those potentials in the upstairs part. Okay? And so the vibrational spectroscopy, this resonance Raman spectroscopy, shows me that. Let me get there. Okay, so first of all, so I have to, I have to make a comparison between these two bands, right? Same time delay, just, just different in that, that Raman wavelength. Okay? Some of these transitions are strong in both spectra. These don't do much. Okay? Regardless of which of the secondary excitation wavelength I get, I get strong <coughs> enhancement in ring breathing modes and in this carbon-carbon, this ethylene stretches. And that's not surprising because in both cases I'm moving pi electrons between bonding and non-bond anti-bonding orbitals. So what am I doing? I'm changing the ring, uh, the bond alternation in the rings, and I'm changing these ethylenic stretches, right? Um, so both cases we see enhancements because that electronic transition changes the molecule in a way that moves along these vibrational coordinates. Okay, Some of these vibrations show up more strongly in this 400 nanometer resonance. Okay, So what do these look like? So this 400 nanometer resonance, remember this was the non-reactive, it, it was green up here, but this is my blue excitation. Okay, This is the one that if I did it before the barrier crossing, which is where I'm measuring this, then it just relaxes back down. In other words, there's no reaction out of that state. Okay, And I get you know, enhancement in a couple of modes, but these are not modes that do anything in terms of driving that chemical reaction. Right? None of these vibrations move this thing from the reactant state towards the product state. But if I look at the 800 nanometer resonance, okay, I see one particular mode that stands out as strong as anything else. That's the carbon-carbon stretching mode. Okay, now this is a little preliminary. I'm going to admit that right up front. Okay, but the fact that we see enhancement in a carbon-carbon stretching mode that we haven't fully assigned it yet, but that looks an awful lot like that same stretching mode that would get us over this carbon-carbon bond barrier crossing. Right, to stretch that bond. What does that say? That says that if I take the red photon to the upper state here, the steepest slope on that potential is along a carbon-carbon bond stretching coordinate, which is just what I need to do to get over this barrier if I want to make it to product state. Okay? I'll admit, that's still a little bit circumstantial. But we've come a long way from where we started with the system. Okay? And so as we continue to s explore this vibrational spectroscopy through this electronic resonance, I think we're going to start to learn a lot of interesting things about this upper excited state. Which, after, rem remember, this is something that is it's short-lived. It lives for 100 or 200 femtoseconds. It's very difficult to measure experimentally. And it's hard to calculate. Okay? So um, I think I'm close on time, right? So I'm wrapping up here. Um, so here's, here's what I've, I've showed you, hopefully, right? So let me, let me kind of bring this back real quick, right? Um, I'm excited about doing fundamental, you know, using spectroscopy to un understand something about dynamics, fundamental dynamics of a molecule. It would apply in a lot of places. But after all, what we're doing is related to this idea of this gated switching, right? So one photon, remember this photo switch, you'd like to have one photon that does nothing so that you can read which state, am I in this closed ring structure or not? Okay, but you'd like to be able to gate this. So if I use the right pulse sequence, or the right shaped laser pulse to absorb two photons at the right time delay and the right wavelength, can I drive this thing over the hill and actually do some erasure? And this is a m number that the Japanese group has measured for an efficiency. So you go from 1% to 60% conversion. Okay, there's some funny business in that number. You should trust that number. Okay, it has, you have to do a few cycles to get to this. Um, but the point is that that's actually controlling chemistry, right? So we're doing this control of a chemical reaction. Okay, um, 
And so you've probably read this. So, so the point of this then is that you know the fundamental side is that we're exploring higher excited electronic states. We're exploring really what we're doing is we're exploring new regions of potential energy surfaces, right? The problem with the one photon excitation is you put the molecule up there, the marble rolls downhill, and you have almost no control over it. What we're doing here is we put the marble up there, we let it move a little bit, and we give it another kick when we want and where we want, and now all of a sudden we open up this, this whole potential energy space to start exploring different reaction pathways of the molecule. Okay, here's one example, you know, who knows, down the road maybe we can do this to really control reaction outcomes. Okay, so that's what we're after. And along the way, I just highlight this last point, right? I think what we're really, I mean, are we going to find new physics? I've given you a kind of packaged picture here, simple cartoons, single states upstairs, but you should be asking, does it even make sense if there are a lot of states up there, does it even make sense to think within the Born-Oppenheimer approximation? And, and the reality is that we have these curve crossings and conical intersections all over the place, and so maybe we just need a whole different way to describe the dynamics of molecules in these highly excited states. Um, we'll see where it goes from there, okay? All right, so last slide to, to, to close up. So yes, if we want to control reactions, we better understand them. That's my closing comment, OK? We can do something about that for these photo switches. Um, I don't know if this is the most exciting thing. We don't use CDs and DVDs very much anymore, right? So maybe that's outdated. But um, <laughs> the field is now closed. Nominations are, are closed. Um, the field has been determined. There will be 13 or 14 cars. This was announced like two weeks ago. Um, 13 or 14 cars will be racing in 2021. I don't know if any of them are going to use two-pole sequences, probably not, but maybe next time around we'll have an entry. Okay. So um, most important slide of all because uh, you know, I've had a lot of help along the way, uh, that row in particular, um, with, with the group that, that's done this. Uh, a couple of people involved specifically, Marco Carcato has done some of the, the calculations with us along the way. Um, I, had, I was fortunate to spend a summer at the University of Rome uh, in a physics department with Tullio Scapino. He's the one that taught me how to do this resonance Raman technique experimentally. Um, and then the work that we've done is there have been a lot of people involved, but the, the work primarily was done by, that I showed you, was, was done by uh, Cassandra Ward, who was my first PhD student, uh, Tim Quincy, uh, who did the, the, the pump repump measurements. Tim Quincy um, and, and Matt Barkley together um, did a lot of the Raman measurements. Um, Kristen Burns is, is gearing up to, to take over there, and Dan Johnson's gearing up to take over there. Um, but everybody here has contributed in a lot of different areas. Um, so with that, let me thank you, and i will be happy to answer any questions. Maybe I have missed this. Uh, so it's the pulse one and pulse two. Uh, what determines the time delay between these two? Like how long after pulse one is sent the second one? Well, we can control that. So that's that's one of the measurements that we we make in there. Um, so we can get back to it. Um, oops. Uh, okay. So for example, this is us. We scan that delay between the two pulses right here. Oops, I've lost my pointer. Good timing. Um, there we go. Um, so we, we scan that time delay. So it's three laser beams coming in. In this particular measurement, we set the probe out at long delay and just let it sit there. That's so long, the reaction's over. And then we take these two pulses and we just scan them back and forth. In one of your first slides, you had uh, this cycle that was both thermal and both uh, UV. Um, and you mentioned 26 hours and stuff. Yeah. I was trying to understand what the time scale involved in this and maybe what the efficiency of this cycle. I, I don't know those numbers off offhand. So the the the, the, the light driven step is fast. The photoisomerization is fast. It's it's a few picosecond time scale. It's actually very similar to the reactions that I just showed you. The slow step here is this thermal step, okay? Because you have to thermally overcome a smaller barrier that goes in the right direction to get here, and then another photon. So as far as you know, the overall speed it's limited by those those thermally activated steps, and so there is some work being done now to make all four of these light driven or to lower the barrier for the thermal part of the reaction, that's what a real chemist can work on, okay, because that means changing the molecule. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's um, a, a hot area, let's say, right? This won the Nobel Prize, so now everybody's making these things. Let you. So as a dumb theorist, I just have to wonder 
Is there any barrier to, is there any reason you stop at two pumps? Can you do this with three and four pumps? Just a series of excitations all in a row? Is that something? If you talk to this row, they're going to tell you it's hard enough already. <laughs> but, but in principle, not, no. In principle, you could do this in a lot of different ways. In fact, you could, you could get a lot smarter with it. Um, I don't know where I am in my talk here, but you could get a lot smarter with this. Um, you know, and even think about using a shape pulse. I'm using a femtosecond pulse and a second femtosecond pulse. And the original measurements where they proposed this mechanism, the Japanese group proposed that there was a, a two-photon sequence. They used one laser, and they said, if I do it with a femtosecond laser pulse, right, I get two photons absorbed right here, nothing happens. But if I stretch my pulse into picoseconds, that means that the, the pulse duration is long enough that the molecule can evolve and then get re-excited. Okay, so that works. And so what that means is actually you have a lot of opportunities along this surface to kick it up again. Okay, and that's how you get to that 60% conversion yield. Um, but now you could think about getting really smart about this, right? Why not put in a, a, a shaped laser pulse that has the wavelengths you want coming in at the time you want, and you could make this thing really efficient. And that's not far away from the realm of reality because all you need is a pulse shaper. This is common technology. So tell the NSF to give me some money and maybe we can do it. I think that's a good idea. So I'm just curious about you know how you actually decide to choose molecules for this study, right? There are tons of molecules. So would you rather to like use this tool, like this beautiful tool, to explore new molecules, or say rather the other way around, say, okay, this molecule is well known, we have like theorists already calculated all this you know up level electronic state and then basically you can have some fun to you know manipulate this transition. So, so which way? So we, we've tried it both ways. Um, and it turns out, so what we've done here, we're picking one molecule and sticking with it. These are, these are really hard experiments, and so we have to try them a lot to get you know, those ugly spectra that I showed you. Um, we've actually tried a lot of different compounds, but they don't all behave quite as conveniently. This one is commercially available, so it's easy to get. We have lots of it, um, and it doesn't break down. A lot of the other molecules, you can't get them commercially because they switch you know, hundreds or thousands of times, and then they're dead. Okay, so this one's really unique in that longevity. It's, it's really resistant to fatigue is what it's called. Um, so that's why this is such a popular molecule. Um, and yeah, we'd love to do this. We have done this with others. And you know, just putting it all together has been the slow part. So the first time I heard that today. <laughs> um, yeah, the angular momentum in, in these systems doesn't, doesn't really contribute because that gets washed out, right? We're doing an electronic excitation in the big molecule, so any angular momentum, I think, is just gets mixed in, and that, that information is lost pretty rapidly, so it doesn't carry forward. Yeah. So, so what is the, in this picture, what is the re reaction coordinate? Yeah. Um, well, so that's where with the, the calculations, I guess this is, I don't have the picture I usually have in here. Um, so the, so the, it's, it's multidimensional, right? But the two most important motions, we think, this barrier crossing is the carbon-carbon stretching. That's, that's the ring starting to open. And the second one that I'm not really showing here, but in some other dimension, is that the two halves of the molecule have to come out of plane. So the torsion is the molecule comes out of plane. That's what brings it to the conical intersection. And then it gets to the ground state. And then it has to decide, do I keep going to the product, or do I snap back to the closed ring structure? OK, and that's, that's determined when it goes back to the ground state. But the two motions are the bond stretching and the torsion. OK, so back to the original, you know, the previous slide. And I, I'm not, yeah, no, not uh, go back. Which, which shows your two pulse, you know? Oh, the two pulses. Yeah. Yeah. This one. So, uh, why, why, you know, the once you decided the molecule into the, you know, the upper the pulp, you know, the electronic structure, then it will relax back to to the other. Yeah, so I think that's the question, right? Is what controls that? I mean, we don't really know. This is an observation now. When you re-excite it. In some cases, we see 
more product, and in other cases we don't. And that's that's the part that we're after because this is a pretty complex. This is a very simple picture, but it's in reality it's complicated. There are a lot of different electronic states. They're connected in a lot of ways. There are a lot of these conical intersections. So the molecule, when you get up there, can find a lot of different paths down. So you do have a timing information, right? I mean, the, it depends on how, you know, what yeah. is the time delay between your second pulse and your probe. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, well, I mean, that's, that's what we try to extract. So if I go to, sorry, I lost my picture here. Um, that's, that's what we try to extract here, right? There is a time delay. The different time delays is what tells us that there must be a difference between these two states. What exactly that means, I think, is still too hard for us to say, but in sort of a general cartoonish picture, it says that when we excite, right, if we excite here at this point versus exciting at this point, we get different effects. There is time delay as well as energy dependence. Are you really talking about the case space, right? So if it's a case space, and then if you're expecting to, you know, have some non-radiated recombination, so then your case changing, right? Then you would probably relax well, so, so, so for a molecular picture, right, so I'm thinking about vibrational coherence. So I'm thinking about the actual motions of the nuclei. I think that's what you mean by K-space, right? Um, so we think about it in terms of those nuclear motions. And so that, that's what I'm describing, it's specific nuclear motions, right? It's, an, it's a, a single molecule. Um, so what happens, all of this reaction, this is all dark reaction. That's what the conical intersection does. The conical intersection is what allows your marble to roll downhill through different curve crossings. There's no emission here in this particular molecule, okay? And, and that's, that's what I mean about these different curve crossings. What pathway the system takes as it finds its way downhill is what determines the outcome of the reaction. And so if we want to control the reaction, we just have to put them, it's like Plinko, right? You put the marble somewhere else up here and it'll rattle down to a different place. Okay, and so we're just trying to exp understand where do we want to put our Plinko chip to win the game. Okay, I think it's time for us to close the Plink. talk. After that, since Chris is not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs>